Okay, I really do don't have to say anything really since uh, you can see everything on there. It's about uh, uh, Debian-based distribution for schools in Switzerland. Uh, I saw in your program and uh, here to talk about that is uh, Gaudens Steinlin. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, it's quite hard to be the one speaking about uh, after Jacob Applebaum. I think people are still out, so maybe a few more will join us later. So, but I'll start anyway. Um, my talk will have kind of two parts. First, I will give you an overview about LearnStick. I think most of you haven't heard of it at all, so I will tell you what it is. And um, I will briefly talk about how Debian could help improve LearnStick and what we try and want to improve to be a better citizen in the Debian community. What are the project goals? Um, the project goal is described as um, providing a mobile and secure learning environment. Some <coughs> we want to run everywhere, so LearnStick should be able to run on old computers, maybe 10 years old computers or even older. Some schools have really, really old hardware. They get hardware donated from somewhere that others already thought it's too old to use anymore. Um, it should have a low administrative overhead for the schools, so no administration basically should be needed. They shouldn't need any servers. They should be able to use it with minimal Unix and Linux knowledge themselves. Um, they shouldn't have to also um, have need to have uh, user management and stuff like that, so they have to enter all their students in a system that sh all shouldn't be needed. Um, we want to be ready to use, so all the software that they might want to have should already be installed. So they don't have to deploy it and afterwards um, install additional software for them to be useful, for it to be useful. And it should, that's not necessary, but it should enable kind of bring your own device scenarios where students can bring their own computers and work with the system in their school. And that's not exactly bring your own device, but with it comes with it, they should also be able to take the system home and use the same system they use in school at home. We have a focus on non-technical end users. So um, we're trying to build a system that is good to use for non-technical users. Not only the students, they're sometimes just also too young, so they have to learn to become technically competent first but also most teachers are not very technically proficient. And we want to have a stable base system plus more or less latest up-to-date applications. So how does the project look like? Um, <coughs> we don't have much project structure um, at all. The project is funded by the University of, of Applied Science of Northwestern Switzerland. Um, the university or the one person employed by the university that does this project provides free support for the schools in Northwestern Switzerland. So if Switzerland is grouped in cantons and this university is funded by several of those cantons. If schools inside those cantons want to use it, they don't have to pay anything for support. I mean, it's free software anyway. You can download it and use it at no cost. But if you want support from us, others 
have to buy uh, support contracts. The, it's usually done on a basis um, where you pay something per year per student. <coughs> we are two people working part-time on the project. The founder of the project is Ronnie Sanke. He's also employed at this university, but doing lunch tech is only part of his job. And the second one is me. I was kind of brought in like, I think three years ago, and my involvement is roughly working one day a week on it. And we don't have much infrastructure. We have a package repository. We have a download site where you can download the ISO image. And we have our Git repositories on GitHub. We have two variants of the system. So the standard learn stick is about 4.3 gigabytes big. It's the size that just fits on a DVD. It includes various desktops. We want to offer people a choice of desktops. So we have GNOME, KDE, XFCE, and even the smaller ones for those that really run on low-end hardware where the big desktops don't work. Um, <coughs> this is an open and unrestricted environment. So people can tamper with it, they can play with it, they can learn with it, and it has passwordless root access. But we don't have any network services enabled on it. Then the second variant is the LearnStick exam environment. This is about two gigabyte. It's a restricted environment you can use for exams. It disables all access to your internal drives and to external devices that are not the LearnStick system itself. It has firewall network and it's used so um, <coughs> people, uh, schools can do exams where the students bring their own computers but they can't bring their own materials with the computers. And we do custom builds for our so support contract customers. There's lots of uh, proprietary learning software, some of which is even mandatory or a school decided that for their school, this software will be used in this class and stuff like that. And as much as we can, we try to include um, this uh, into their builds and make it easy for them to use. So our philosophy about non-free software is a bit like um, we have to do compromises to at least bring people to use our free system. We hope that in the process of getting to know the advantages of this free system, they will see the disadvantages of their proprietary software. So what it, is it technically? It's mostly Debian. We use Debian stable plus Debian backports, plus we do our own backports of some stuff, plus some third party packages, plus some LearnStick spe specific packages. Third party packages uh, is for example, if upstream projects build newer versions of um, so De Debian packages of newer versions, we tend to use those if they're halfway reasonably done. <laughs> but it's based on Debian Live, so it's a live system. And we have in our latest version, the Jesse based version, we'll have GNOME as a default desktop, but others are available. As you can see here, also in this mix, it's also a compromise of the resources that are, that are available. We just can, we just don't have the time to redo packaging that was already done somewhere else. So because um, the options then are just either not include this or include the package that exists, we mostly prefer to just take what, it, what exists. 
our distribution, main distribution method is still to have an ISO image and this ISO image includes a highly compressed squash FS. As our users are not very technical, many of them still burn really physically the ISO image to DVD and prefer that to then create USB sticks from it. <coughs> so the usual way you use it is that the software that the live system that in the, is on the ISO image, you copy it to a USB stick and we have a special program to make this process really easy. Um, the more advanced users know how to use virtualization and uh, don't burn the ISO image anymore. We're on E386 as the architecture um, just because it's more universally usable. It runs on all AMD64 um, computers while AMD64 doesn't run on all the computers that currently still are using LearnStick. We are planning to move to AMD64 if uh, the last E386 users will have moved to a newer hardware. And we're trying to keep the delta to Debian as, as small as possible. So I will quickly show you some specific hardware uh, software we've done. The first is this program we call DL Copy. It originally stands for Debian Live Copy. You can't install a copy with it all possible Debian Live systems. It's really it has quite some assumption it, it that are specific to how we build our images. And with this, you can install on storage media, you can repair or upgrade your uh, sticks, and you can even have a stick and convert it back to a new ISO image. And the installation looks like this. You will see all the sticks that are connected to the system, and you can say how much uh, how big the so-called data partition should be, where the modifications to your file system are um, stored, and you can see set, or, or no, that's the squash fast partition is kind of fixed. And you can have something called an exchange partition, with, which is a file system that is Windows accessible, so if you want to still use it on other operating systems. Then we have LearnStick Welcome, that's a small wizard that runs on first boot. You can do like download additional non-free software like Google Earth. Um, you can um, configure the teaching system, which is a system that allows the teacher to see the screens of their students. Um, and some other things. Then one nice thing we developed is XML boot. XML boot is a GFX boot payload. GFX boot, I don't know if you know it, is a graphical uh, interpreter to have uh, graphical boot screens for mainly system works. And it uses a PostScript-like language and Ronnie implemented this nice boot menu in this PostScript-like language with like a very few registers and stuff. So on boot, you see this, you can select the language, you can select the desktop you want to boot, you can select if you want to use your data partition or if you don't want to use it or if it should be read-only and yeah. It's kind of usable by non-technical users because they can, uh, it's easy to select, but it's still, um, I always see people trying to use the mouse and obviously the mouse doesn't work here. It's just keyboard only. Then we have a few more additions which don't have good screenshots. Um, I developed something I call LearnStick Guest. It's the use case for this is you have LearnStick installed on a computer on its hard drive and you don't want that the students have to reboot it all the time to work with their stick. So you, they can plug in their stick, we mount their system 
so that their home partition on the stick is the home partition of the learn stick user on the system and then automatically lock them in. So the software is on the computer, but the home is from the stick. Then we have the firewall we use in the exam environment. It's a very simple thing with IP tables and tiny proxy, and it just allow it's denied by default, and it allows you to whitelist some stuff. And that's an old project of Ronnie. Uh, J Backpack is a simple backed up GUI to a diff backup. So why we're a Debian derivative and why we're not just a Debian blend or Debian itself? Where do we deviate from Debian? So we have some non-free packages in the base install. It's basically hardware support. We uh, pre-install the non-free graphics drivers because for many schools, 3D graphics for games or Stellarium or other these things are quite important and the performance of the non-free drivers is still better. That's one point and the more important point is that there is still hardware that just doesn't work with the free drivers. And we install firmware because, I mean, you can't live without some firmware on most computers nowadays, unfortunately. <coughs> We do some optimizations for non-technical users, which are mostly small things, but some of them are not really generic enough to go to Debian. We do bug reports for these if it's applicable, but as we have Debian and KDE, uh, Debian, GNOME and KDE installed uh, side by side, um, because we want users to be able to choose, but we want only the KDE applications to show up in the menu uh, if you choose KDE and the other way around for GNOME. But that's not something you actually want in Debian because in Debian you would just say, yeah, if you don't want this application, just don't install it. But as we are a live system, um, we don't have that option. And there are some live specific customizations. It's mostly fix up for hardware assu assumptions. Um, one example is that some programs store sound card configurations in home and stuff like that. Some of this is upstreamed uh, if the Debian Live maintainer accepts our patches. And we have secure boot support. We did that not because we really like secure boot or we think it's it, as we do it now, it's also not a security improvement at all, but uh, our users don't know how to modify their BIOS settings. So we, we would have been kind of just not being able to run on all these Windows 8 shipping computers where Secure Boot is enabled by default because of Microsoft policies, so we went to the process to get our shim signed by Microsoft. Um, I learned quite a lot about how this works and the policies around it by doing this and if there's interest in Debian, I'm willing to help, but I've, I'm a bit wary about uh, of the political uh, side of it, so I didn't push too hard. Um, So, where could we improve collaboration with Debian? Um, currently, there's no uh, or not much collaboration with Debian Edu. I mean, we profit from the work they do in terms of learning software that's packaged and stuff like that, but we don't have any direct contact. I think that would be interesting to have. I don't know if someone working on Debian Edu is here in the audience. We should try harder to upload all our stuff to Debian where possible. Um, these are some of the packages 
that I think could perfectly well go to Debian. Um, there are others, mostly those that are written in Java, that need some cleanup first. They don't build cleanly currently. They have packages that are not really policy compliant, but they're free software. It's doable. It just needs to be done. <coughs> Some packages are really only useful on a LearnStick system. So we have something called LearnStick config that is uh, our ad additional live config script. Uh, if you know live, con live Debian live, live config is the last component that runs um, of Debian live. It's run after the init started first and it does all the customizations uh, one needs for a live system. And we have some additional scripts for us. I'm not really sure if it, if it would be appropriate to upload those to Debian or not. And um, some of our packages are um, just hacks and I don't think they should go to Debian. One example is that uh, we ha do quite a lot of file diversions for small files. Like I said, we're uh, changing desktop files and instead of having to, like if you change the desktop file of LibreOffice, having to rebuild LibreOffice, we just have a package that diverts the desktop file, which is not something you want to have in Debian, but uh, it solves two problems for us. Uh, we don't have to wait hours to build LibreOffice and if LibreOffice gets an update, our diversion will still be there. And we're thinking about uploading some or even all of our own backports to backports.debian.org. And there are two things that currently um, stop us from doing that. One is that I'm the only DD on the team, so I ha will have to do that all. The other thing is that the expectation for backports is that you kind of try to maintain them through the lifetime of the stable release, and we're not really sure if we're capable of doing that in a satisfactory way. And the third is that um, currently we don't contact package maintainers about doing backports, and I think that's something that's advised for um, backports. It's usually not a big deal, but it still needs to be done. <coughs> and we're in the process of making our development process more transparent, so we will have a wiki soon. We already have the to-do list in our Git repository, but it's kind of probably still hard to find. Um, yeah, stuff like that, so it's possible too. Okay, yeah. Um, that's my last slide. Um, how can Debian help? We always appreciate backports. Um, we're very happy if people that um, do uh, maintain desktop applications, do backports to stable. Um, you can advertise it in your school, in your community, wherever you see it fit. And we have some nice ideas for the future if people would want to take an interesting, challenging project, like replace XML boot by an Excel program running in the initRD, so you can really use your mouse and do all the fancy stuff. Um, Live boot currently has lots of loops where it waits for devices to appear. It would be really nice to have that, that ported to Draycut or some other event-driven model. And um, the SquashFS plus, our, plus overlay approach has its own problems. Um, it would be really nice to move to something that's more snapshot based, but SquashFS had the one big advantage that it does really, really good compression. And I'm not aware of anything snapshot based that can do that much compression. 
I don't know if we have time for questions. Not, not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> we have to take them uh, during lunch directly, I think. Okay, or well, I will be outside, so if you want to ask questions. Thank you.